So ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Bill Taylor. I'm the Acting Executive Vice President of the United States Institute of Peace. And uh, uh, on behalf of the Institute of Peace, I want to welcome you and the panel, the UN panel, um, to, to this building as well as to Washington. We think this is a great opportunity um, for people in the audience, also for members of the panel, uh, to have this, uh, have this discussion. Uh, some of you may be in this building for the first time. Um, a couple of you in particular on the, on the first row. Um, uh, USIP um, is an independent, nonpartisan government institution established 30 years ago. This is our year of 30th anniversary, uh, funded by the Congress uh, to increase the nation's capacity to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict around the world. Um, as the world knows, as everyone in this room knows um, all too well over the past 25 years in order to prevent, mitigate, and resolve international conflict, we need the United Nations peacekeeping. And so it is a, a great opportunity for us to have to welcome this panel here to today. A strong United Nations peacekeeping force has played a significant role at various points in violence, de-escalation, and in solidifying fragile peace. With this in mind, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon created the high-level independent panel on peace operations to undertake a comprehensive review of the difficult issues peacekeeping now faces. We are very pleased that the high-level panel uh, has chosen to come to Washington to get your advice and to listen to your questions and to hear from Deputy Secretary of State Anthony Blinken later on this morning. I'd also like to welcome um, all of our online audience participating uh, in uh, the webcast here uh, they and everyone in the room can join the conversation about today's event on Twitter with the hashtag FuturePeaceOps. A word about our process here this morning. Uh, you have, I hope, index cards uh, that have been provided to you as, you as you came in. We ask that you place either your question for the panel or your recommendation for the panel for their report in a succinct manner on that card and then pass it to the ends of your rows where our staff will pick these up and give them to Ambassador George Moose, who, I, who is going to chair here today, and I will introduce in, in one moment. Again, welcome to the Institute of Peace. I am pleased now to turn the event over to Ambassador Moose. Before I do that, there is another George um, uh, here at the Institute of Peace, which is uh, Dr. George Lopez, who is the Vice President of our Academy and also well known to all people associated with the UN. So George and George, we, we have this. Ambassador Moose, um, you will see from his extended bio in the booklet that you have, uh, has had a long career of service. Um, Ambassador Moose was a career member of the US Foreign Service. He attained the, ra the rank of career ambassador. Among his many assignments from 1991 to 1992, he was U.S. Representative to the United Nations Security Council. And from 1998 to 2001, he was U.S. Permanent Representative to the European Office of the United Nations in Geneva. In June 2007, he was nominated by the White House and again confirmed by the Senate um, as uh, a member of the Board of Directors of the United States Institute of Peace. Ambassador Moose. Uh, Bill, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, my um, privilege and pleasure uh, this morning is to be able to introduce to you, uh, actually to people who don't need introduction, and indeed you have their full bios in your, uh, in your uh, uh, welcome kits. Um, but we were delighted um, when the Secretary General d decided last fall to appoint a high-level panel to undertake this comprehensive review of uh, UN peace operations. Uh, because UN peace operations have become vital to all of us, those who are concerned about the protection of civilians, those who are concerned about ending violence and violent conflicts around the world, those of us in the peace building community who cannot frankly do our work without the peacekeepers of this world. So it's my pleasure um, to introduce the chair and the vice chair of the Secretary General's High Level Panel. Um, again, two people who need really no introduction. President Jose Ramos Horta, the chair of the panel, uh, is a Nobel laureate. He's a journalist, uh, a promoter of uh, independence for 
Timor-Leste. Uh, he was for 30 years the central figure and a guiding force in his country's struggle for independence. Um, and after more than two decades in exile, he returned uh, home in 1999, and where he served successively as the foreign minister, as prime minister, and then as head of state of a newly independent Timor-Leste. Uh, upon leaving office, he was appointed as the Secretary General's special representative and head of the United Nations Integrated Peacebuilding Office in Guinea-Bissau. Uh, as his vice chair, he has uh, someone with more than 35 years of international service, uh, Ms. Amira Huck, who currently serves as the United Nations Under Secretary General for Field Support, <clears throat> which, uh, as we know, is the, the vital <laughs> foundation on which all of these operations rest. She previously uh, was the Special Representative of the Secretary General in the United Nations Integrated Mission in Timor-Leste. Uh, she has held senior positions within the United Nations Development Program and served as the United Nations Resident Coordinator in Malaysia, as well as in the Lao People's Democratic Republic. Um, we're delighted to have them both with us. The purpose of this initial session, I think, is really to help inform us about the purpose of this mission. And so what I wanted to do was invite uh, the chair, President uh, Ramos Horta, to say a few words about their purpose, their hopes uh, uh, for this uh, session here at USIP this morning. And you can do that here, or you can do it from the podium. It's your... Can do, yeah. Yes, sure. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be in Washington, D.C. again. Before I uh, continue, uh, we'd like to introduce uh, our other panel colleagues who are here with us. Uh, I start from uh, the left, my left, Ambassador Wang, former uh, Ambassador of China, former China uh, Special Envoy in Afghanistan, uh, former uh, US, uh, UN Undersecretary General, US Ambassador, Lim Pasco, uh, sitting here. Uh, Hilda Johnson, uh, former uh, Norwegian Minister for Development, uh, formerly with UNICEF, UNDP, uh, and the more recent is um, Special President Secretary General in uh, South Sudan. She's publishing a book, and I will advise you all to keep an eye uh, and buy uh, the book. I'm promoting the book for her. <laughs> Actually, introducing the book to friends in the publishing industry, because really, tremendous uh, experience. Uh, then Alexander Ilichev, former uh, uh, Russian diplomat, former top UN uh, official, mediator with the Department of Political Affairs. And uh, I think I introduced everyone. And uh, last but not least, Madeleine O'Donnell. She is the one who always writes my speeches. And, uh, uh, but I will not make the mistake like a former US uh, candidate running once for office. And uh, the speech, had remarks like say, if so and so is there in the audience, you say so. If, and he just kept reading, if he's there, if he's so there. <laughs> so, <laughs> she just hand me over a note, but I hope I don't make that mistake. I'm not new to Washington to introduce a bit of my personal self. I first came here 75, 76. And uh, I met some uh, young uh, congressmen. Uh, one was Tom Harkin from Iowa. He had just been elected. And uh, he, following Indonesia's invasion of Timor in 75, he decided to push a resolution of sense of the house in the US Congress. Out of some 500 people, he got only 30 votes. And <laughs> Uh, only, you know, to illustrate the extent of uh, an awareness about uh, Timor-Leste at the time. Met also a young congressman, uh, Tony Hall. You know, you might know uh, a great man. One, a few years later, he went on hunger strike 
for 25 days to protest against the elimination of the Hunger Committee, of which he was the chair. And he is not someone that would do a hunger strike for self-interest, like me, I, I, I would probably do. But he was actually very elegant, slim, and he almost died with the hunger strike. So to, this is only to illustrate some of the great people in this uh, town, in the US Congress, who I credit you know, for helping my own country being free. And, uh, but obviously the most visible of, of all was President Clinton in 99. He played a critical central role. Uh, in 99, I, fr I was here in Washington. I flew to Auckland for the APEC summit. I didn't have money. Some friends here in Washington gathered together $7,000, and I went to Auckland. And arriving in Auckland, I stayed in a very humble uh, guest house called Ponsonby, owned by a New Zealand couple. In the end, after I left, they didn't charge me for my stay. They were sympathetic. And, uh, but arriving there, I got a phone call from the White House, a very, uh, you know, uh, towering voice, you know, um, deep voice, saying he was the appointment secretary of the President of the United States. And the President would like very much to see me right away. And they understood I was busy, they were watching me on, on CNN, and said whether I could get, make the time to come straight to the hotel where President Clinton was then. With my silly sense of humor, I almost joke. I said, well, I have to check my schedule whether <laughs> I can. But I thought, don't make any jokes. So I went straight to see President Clinton. And uh, that was the turning point, the decisive you know, of the change of uh, US policies and paved the way for Timur. So I'm very uh, uh, in familiar uh, uh, territory. And if you go to my country, Dili, my street is called Robert Kennedy Boulevard. I, uh, the street had no name then. When I decided to baptize, the whole Kennedy family contributed. Ethel Kennedy gave me her late husband's bronze bust. Ted Kennedy sent a message. Uh, Patrick Kennedy sent a message. So if you go there, you will find a room full of uh, American, but particularly the memorably of the 50s. So that's my personal introduction. I have read uh, Samantha Powers' speech yesterday in Brussels. I feel a bit intimidated after that speech because, <laughs> because it's brilliant. And uh, I would endorse personally you know, most of what it is argued and said there. I first met Samantha many years ago in Timor. She came for a visit. And uh, she was still with Harvard. And she told me, Jose, I'm going to quit Harvard. I'm going to work for a new uh, US senator. And I said, who is that? And uh, she said, uh, Barack Obama. I said, who is that, Barack Obama? And uh, when you come to Washington, I will introduce you to him. I, well, it, too bad, too soon he became president of the United States, so I didn't meet him as a senator. Only to il illustrate the extraordinary changes you know, in the world since I first came to this country. And uh, I will now uh, move on to my uh, remarks. We are, as a panel appointed by the Secretary General back in uh, October, November, we are 17 members from across the globe with uh, accumulated uh, 600 years of uh, experience in different, like mine, uh, that you know, and uh, some of my colleagues uh, present here, and many others who are not. So we were asked, tasked by the Secretary General in a very, very limited time. Uh, initially, he told us to deliver the report and recommendation by April. I responded, Mr. Secretary General, you realize we are not all Koreans. You know, the Koreans, they work seven days a week, 20 hours a day. I'm an islander, and we are very relaxed people. <laughs> so, so he gave us one extra month. End of this month, we will deliver our, our report and recommendations. The, the mandate was on, uh, to review the peace and security architecture of the UN. Special political missions, which are not very known to the general public, because it's more discreet. It does 
what everybody talk about, preventive, preventive diplomacy, mediation, it helps in peace building in countries in transition, sometimes in combination with peacekeeping, while peacekeeping ongoing. And then the other mechanism, more well known, the peacekeeping, that has taken much more different uh, uh, conf dimension, mandate, and configuration, as uh, you know. So our mandate is very limited on how to perfect the system, uh, the peace and security architecture. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of hearings around the world, from uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh, Asia-Pacific Regional Consultation, to Cairo, Addis Ababa, Brussels, and then smaller uh, workshops organized by different governments, like in Japan, Islamabad, uh, Delhi, Amsterdam with the Dutch, uh, uh, in uh, Helsinki, colleagues of ours have been to Congo, uh, some are going to Mali. So we have done extensive hearing. We don't have a particular opinion at the moment, rightly so, because we are gathering your views, and uh, by in the next few days we start drafting. By end of May we deliver our uh, draft to the Secretary General. I would like to uh, thank uh, Ambassador George Moose, Ambassador Bill Taylor, uh, uh, Peter Yeo of UN Foundation, Assistant Secretary uh, Crocker, and all of you uh, for uh, honoring us in uh, inviting us here. Uh, we know that since the end of the Cold War, the number of violent conflict has fallen dramatically. Many factors contributed to this, but definitely the UN peace operations uh, had a significant contribution in that. I could mention a number of situations that are not known, but where the UN played a critical role, like where I serve in Guinea-Bissau, uh, without the need for a, a peacekeeping or peace enforcement, uh, only through the political mission, it, we were able to uh, return the country from a military coup, 40 years of failures, to constitutional order. And in my own country, a different experience with the United uh, Nations. And if it were not for the UN active uh, presence, I don't know, frankly, whether we alone would be able to uh, resolve uh, the situation. After decades of decline of, in violent conflict, we have now seen a slight reversal of this trend, largely to the, due to the conflicts in Africa and ongoing conflicts in the Middle East. The nature of conflicts, types of actors involved, changing, and the tasks undertaken by UN operations and the other Security Council mandate operations also continue to involve. UN uh, <coughs> peacekeepers, officials op are working in very demanding environments, such as Mali, Iraq, Somalia. And then we deal with financial constraints. And the UN has been asked to undertake more and more missions in remote, dangerous places. Our, uh, I mentioned already our uh, mandate. Uh, we have done uh, uh, numerous uh, consultations so far. And our panel has uh, examined other missions besides the ones I mentioned, Timor-Leste. Uh, Iraq, Somalia, Mali. In the course of liberations, and one lesson that emerges is that there is no such thing as a smooth transition from war to peace. Every country had experienced crises that test the will and commitment of parties to peace. They also test the resolve of the United Nations to lead, to act, to deliver. As we walk this path, we had many countries, including the United States, who accompanied us on this path. This is what the United Nations stand for. If it is, this, it is the means by which we provide a collective response and shoulder collective responsibility for our collective present and the future. 
We have seen a growing gap between those who mandate operations and those who carry them out. These are not the principles upon which the United Nations was founded. And we hope that countries with the means may contribute more. So it's a great pleasure, to, a privilege to be here with you today. The United States has spent significant effort this year, beginning with the Biden summit on the strength and capabilities available to the United Nations. There is going to be, uh, on the uh, end of uh, this month, a first ever uh, meeting of uh, chiefs of defense staffs from all over the world, meeting in uh, New York. I will close by saying that the road to peace is not always straight, and each country must find our own way. And it must struggle for an inclusive peace for men, women, and children, for all faith and beliefs. But no country can do without support of the international community. We live in an interconnected world where marginalized and disaffected youth in one country may be recruited to cross the globe and fight in another. A few uh, weeks ago, uh, I was uh, reading the internet and I came across an incredible story. It's a heartbreaking story that uh, made me feel, I would say actually, when people speak uh, highly of me or any of my adult colleagues, I actually feel small when compared with that little girl. The story in uh, Huffington Post of a three-year-old girl in South Sudan walking for four hours through the bush, risk dangers, leading her blind father to the nearest United Nations feeding center. Her name is Nyakhat Pal. She was spotted by a UNICEF registration officer. Uh, these are the stories that uh, sometimes when I personally look at the situation in Congo, endless UN presence there, more than a billion dollars a year, or Darfur, more than a billion dollars a year, no solution in sight. And you, think, you ask, shouldn't we use that money for something else? But I said, no, we cannot abandon these extraordinary people on the ground. We cannot abandon Nyakhat Pal. I told my some panel colleagues that I do not wish the, our report to carry my name, because usually it's like called the Brahimi report. It could end up called Ramuzort report. Yes, no, it's a report of 17 people, so it's not under. So I would like to honor Niakata Pal. The report will be hers. And we have to answer to her why we have failed or, or whether we can deliver peace to her, to her mother, her brothers and sisters. So I end here. And, uh, God bless you all. And my colleagues are here. They will answer questions. Ian Martin just uh, walked in, joining us. Ian Martin was in Libya, special president of Secretary General, was in Nepal, was in Timor-Leste in 99, in an incredible difficult situation, then went again in 2006. So with, with, with Amnesty International 30 years ago. So. Uh, my colleagues who are here, they will also join in answering uh, questions. Thank you and God bless you. Well, Mr. President, uh, as you s you've indicated, we have a bit of a contradiction here. On the one hand, as you indicated in your remarks, the numbers of conflicts, at least statistically, seems to be declining. And yet, the demand for UN peace operations has never been greater. We've added two major operations every year for the last several years. And that demand, um, unless we figure out a better way to manage it, could indeed overwhelm the UN. I, didn't, I wanted to give you a chance also, um, 
Ms. Hook, to, to add any introductory remarks you might want to make here, especially coming from where you are as they have the uh, UN support uh, operations. Well, thank you very much, and um, thank you, uh, everyone, for, for coming here. I think it's very important. This is precisely what I think the panel wants to do, is to interact with all of you, hear your views. Peacekeeping, uh, peace operations of the United Nations is, is something that we all do. And so I think as we reflect as a panel uh, on the kind of responsibility that, it, that is on our shoulders, I think it's very important to hear what you have to say. But let me just say a, f a few things in terms of why uh, the Secretary General, I think, felt it's so important and perhaps there was kind of a groundswell within the UN as well, but within many of our stakeholders, troop contributing countries, uh, police contributing countries, civil society, uh, think tanks, academia, that the Brahimi report was 15 years ago. You know, the ground has changed considerably since then. And I think there was a great need uh, that uh, we must rethink, we must take a relook at what defines us as the United Nations, what defines peace operations. How do we work in the current environment? Are we fit for purpose? Uh, if not, you know, what is it that, 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 that needs to be done? And I think that, that is where, where we are coming from in this. I think over the years, we have seen uh, mandates of the United Nations uh, peace operations uh, become more and more extensive. There is uh, quite a bit of uh, you know, uh, discussion that says these mandates have become almost like a Christmas tree, that you know, everyone sort of hangs their particular interest. Uh, and if you look at mandates of some of the missions, there are 41, 43 tasks. Is it really, is it realistic to expect that with the resources, with the capabilities, with everything else there, that, that those mandates can, can, can be met? And I think more important in terms of whether the mandates can be met or not is the expectations of the populations in these countries. Their expectations are high. And I think they feel that the, the, you know, the uh, positioning of a United Nations mission uh, in that country is going to resolve many of, of, of the kinds of uh, you know, uh, trauma that they've experienced and uh, you know, that life is going to be all right again. But that means that you're looking at the entire gamut of what needs to be done in a post-conflict situation. So it's, if there is a peace agreement, maintaining the peace agreement. It means s stabilizing so that you know, security elements can provide certain space for other kinds of activities to take place. And then there is the, you know, the eternal question of you know, how long does it take to do peace building? How long does it take to build institutions? And again, as I said, expectations are enormous timelines of those expectations are short, not only from the people, but also from donors, those who are giving us the mandates, etc. So I think you know, we really need to uh, address those tensions too. What is realistic? What is achievable? Do we have the means? Do we have the capability? Also recently, because of the volatile situations I think that we find ourselves in, the mandates have been changing in a way that some say there's been kind of an incremental doctrinal shift that has been taking place, particularly with respect to the use of force. And uh, so are we um, you know, looking at chapter seven um, mandates uh, or are we going sort of somewhat beyond that if one were to look at the mandate of the Force Intervention Brigade in DRC which had language to say that we would neutralize some of the armed groups. So where does that fit in with, with the mandate? What is it that, that, that's happening? Uh, you know, how do we need to resolve it then in terms of understanding whether there is a doctrinal shift or, or not? Protection of civilians, as we all know, characterized much of what the Brahimi report was all about, but I think today more than ever, I think, protection of civilians looms large. And again, 
defining what we do, what is protection of civilians, what is the expectation of troop contribute countries and police contributing countries who are in the missions, how do they define it, how do they understand it, how do they react to, to incidents that, that happen where clearly um, you know, the, 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 the safety and security and rights of, of um, uh, populations are, are being attacked in, in, in many different ways. Um, we have also talked about the use uh, in, in sort of chapter eight of the, of the UN mission the increasing use of regional organizations. And particularly, I would say, to single out uh, perhaps more than anyone else, uh, the African Union. Um, the largest number of our missions are in Africa. How do we partner with them? What are their capabilities? So I think we've got a number of issues to, to you know, where we would love to hear your views. Uh, I think these will help uh, inform us. Uh, and, and help in our deliberations as, as we finish our regional consultations. I do want to say that in all the regional consultations that we've had thus far, they've been broad ranging. So it isn't just that we met with member states, uh, but we have met extensively with academia, think tanks, civil society, women's organizations. Our work is also, we're trying to dovetail our work with two other important panels that are, that are concurrent. Uh, one is the panel uh, on the review of the peace building architecture, and the other is the review of uh, resolution 1325, which deals with women, peace, and security. So let me stop there. Indeed. Well, thank you very much, because your, your comments actually anticipate uh, several of the questions that we've received from the audience. Um, one of those you touched on, which is the fact that, uh, you know, once upon a time, peacekeeping operations were fairly simple things about keeping peace, but um, increasingly we have uh, added to that mission and those mandates um, human rights components, um, rule of law components, uh, peace building components. And one of the questions here indeed is how do we integrate these two uh, sometimes very different looking missions, peacekeeping and peace building? Uh, can they, in fact, be done simultaneously? Or what, what are the benefits of incorporating peace-building elements into these peacekeeping operations? This is, uh, and also extending the mandates for longer periods of time. Are, are these questions that you will be looking at? And what, your, what are your sort of preliminary thoughts about, <coughs> about those issues? Uh, maybe with your, with your agreement uh, to share the burden uh, or, and the privilege sure. with my colleagues. Maybe I Hilda, know. would you like to be the first? Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah, now it's coming, now it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Do, do you want to look at yeah, the audience? I'll yeah. look at the audience. <laughs> um, it's a very good question, uh, and it's what a lot of the major peacekeeping missions have been facing uh, for the last 15 years, where increasingly they are multidimensional, including both the traditional um, uh, blue helmet operation, but also huge peace building components um, in the areas you listed. I'm not sure that we could say that these are contradictory. Um, in many ways, a Chapter 7 mandate, at least from protection of civilians' perspective, is necessary in a classical post-conflict environment. Um, for example, in the case of South Sudan, clearly a very critical POC element was needed. At the same time, you can also uh, not manage to only do that you also have to build institutions in the post-conflict environment or just after independence, as was the case in Timor-Leste and is the, uh, was the case in, in South Sudan. I think the challenge is that um, for, for many of, of the missions is, is threefold. One, um, it is about the sequencing and prioritization. And there isn't enough uh, understanding of the situation on the ground, the complexity, and what the right sequencing and prioritization would be. I think the second challenge that many missions face uh, is that peace building is not only about the peacekeeping mission, it's also about uh, understanding the drivers of conflict, the incentives, and an analysis of what would it take to build peace among those different actors. Uh, I think the, that is also part of a weakness of the system, that one doesn't do that in depth 
and hence you get relapse in many situations. You got it in East Timor in 2006, you got it in South Sudan in 2013. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the third element which is critical um, among many uh, is that peace building is not only about what a peacekeeping mission does, it's very much about what everyone else does as well. Yeah. Both domestic uh, political constituencies, but also the donor community. And too much, um, I think through too many, many missions, dilemmas and, and, and where they're facing significant challenges is there isn't a comprehensive and holistic approach to that. Yeah. So the donors go on and do their favorite things, yeah. the mission implements the mandate, and there isn't really a comprehensive approach where one sees, okay, we make sure that these critical elements are done. Because if they are not done, whether it's from the mission side or it is from donors, it is all the political leadership, it's basically going to fail. So I think that's maybe my preliminary thoughts, that there are many, many uh, issues that are not properly addressed and we are not approaching this from a comprehensive perspective based on conflict analysis, based on knowing the drivers of conflict and therefore also knowing how we can try to help the country address them and prevent relapse. And if we look at the relapse rate, unfortunately, that's increasing. And more of the conflicts are now um, relapse conflicts mm -hmm. than actually fresh ones. So maybe those few comments from those my side. Those are very, very helpful indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, sort of following up on that, uh, it suggests, and this is sort of reminiscent of a conversation I was in just a couple of weeks ago about the situation in Eastern Congo and the absence of a holistic approach and the absence of an architecture for how you achieve such an approach. Will you likely be addressing this in your seeking to address this? How do you achieve this more integrated, holistic approach to uh, peacekeeping Lynn. and peace building? Lynn. <laughs> well, I, I catch this one because um, I guess we made the mistake of going to Goma uh, a few weeks ago as part of the group that, that went around and checked the situation there and looked at it. I think it, it varies. If, if I would look at it this way, in the first instance, one thing that we went to was a, a village or a city which had been almost totally depopulated because the bad guys had been in uh, one of the various groups, and don't let me tell you which one it was here because I'm not quite sure. But anyway, they'd come in marauding. They were basically wanting to control the mines. And uh, the peacekeepers went in and, and pushed them back with the, the, the Congolese army, which did the bulk <coughs> of, of the real work in the process. Um, the transformation of that town was dramatic because everybody uh, was so thrilled. 30,000 people came back to the city and uh, they were out there when the force commander was walking around, who happened to be Uruguayan. Uh, every, all the little kids wanted to get their pictures taken with him and such, because this was the very dramatic. These guys had really helped. Now, the tricky part there is that, as in the Congo, as you may, may know, we moved most of the operations from the western Congo to the eastern Congo so that we could be where the action is and really work on it. My preliminary sense from my own thing, and anything we say today, I should say, it's is really ahead. what we saw or our thoughts, because we've got lots of discussions among our group to really get to what we're going to make as recommendations. But it looked like some of the operations were quite good in terms of reaching out. The human rights operation there was quite impressive. They were out all over the country. They understood what they were doing. They understood how they were going about it, and this was a critical part of of the um, uh, cleaning up the, the, the various operations. Any security reform was going to, going to start from people being worried that the human rights guys might, might uh, complain at them for the kinds of things that they were doing. So that was working well. Uh, other parts of it, rehabilitation, I thought <laughs> were not working at all, frankly. And, uh, and so you would look at this and you had to mix the several together. One last thing that I think has really bothered our group a lot in general, and we've asked a lot of questions on it, is, okay, we've got these missions sent out there, whether they're political missions, the large ones, or whether they were peacekeeping missions. Uh, how do they work closely with the country team, which after all was there beforehand, is working on all of these projects, has them going, many long-term projects, strongly supported by the donors, 
uh, how do they work with them very closely and actually build up their programs because they're going to be there after the, after the mission leaves. And I would say this is a very imperfect match at this point. We've, there's a lot more work there to be done. And uh, this is one thing I think that the, the panel is going to be looking at very closely. So I, the short answer, George, mm -hmm. is we're not there yet. Yeah. But uh, I think we're looking clearly, see if we can give some suggestions. Yeah, indeed. Thanks very much, Lynn. Um, the UN peace operations have gotten more complex, not only in terms of the, the breadth of the mandate, uh, but also the kinds of challenges that UN peace operations are now being asked to take on. And the example that immediately comes, well, Congo comes to mind, because there you have both a chapter six and a chapter seven components of that mission. And now in Mali, you actually have a counterterrorism component. How, how is, this, uh, is this a sustainable <laughs> paradigm for UN peace operations? And are, are these questions that the panel will also be looking at, how one integrates or should one integrate these kinds of different purposes within the UN peace yeah, <clears throat> I see Ian Martin's going to get uh, stuck with the difficult ones. I mean, this is probably the most central question <clears throat> yeah, uh, right. that the panel has to address, right. and it's certainly the one that divides member states uh, most right. keenly. Um, <clears throat> to some extent, divides those who mandate operations on the Security Council and the more traditional troop-contributing countries. Um, and you're, 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 you're right. It's, if you go okay. back to the Brahimi report, the doctrine in the Brahimi okay. report uh, was that peace enforcement mm -hmm. was not something to be done by blue helmets, by, by the United Nations. Didn't fully define peace enforcement, but the assumption was that peace enforcement was something mandated by the UN Security Council, but to be carried out by coalitions of the willing or, or of course, at the time of the Brahimi report, the African Union hadn't even been created, uh, but since then it's become the African Union that is the earliest and most robust intervener in Africa, whether it's self or, or through the, uh, the sub-regional organizations. Uh, but increasingly, there have been elements of peace enforcement included in uh, UN peacekeeping mandates. Uh, when the Security Council mandated the uh, Force Intervention Brigade in the Eastern Congo, because of the controversy uh, around this very issue, it said in its resolution that this was not to be regarded as a precedent. Uh, but of course, once something happens, it always becomes uh, potentially a precedent. Uh, and the Mali mandate is not quite so, doesn't specifically talk about offensive operations to neutralize armed groups as the uh, mandate of the Force Intervention Brigade does, but it talks about preventing the return uh, of armed groups to, to northern Mali, and therefore it goes a substantial way in the same direction. Um, and of course, Mali has become the operation that is seeing the largest number of uh, uh, deaths and casualties among UN peacekeepers. Um, so it's a tough question. Um, uh, and it goes to how the capabilities of United Nations operations can be enhanced um, and how far the gap between the desire of the Security Council to give more, in some ways, ambitious mandates to UN operations can be matched with the capability um, not just of, of troop contributors, but of all that surrounds that in terms of, uh, of equipment, what are called enablers, uh, as well as the willingness of contributing countries to put themselves seriously at risk. So uh, that's probably uh, the question that, that we could least mm -hmm. tell you we're, where we're going to where end up wind, uh, <laughs> at the okay. moment. Uh, but the question very reasonably simply asked whether we were addressing it. And yeah. Absolutely, we, we, we have to address it absolutely. as a, a central issue. Very good. Were any, any other? other? So one would you like to add to that? No. Okay. Alexander Ilinger, or next question. Next question. Okay. Um, I mean, this is, uh, I think, a, a central question, and it's been raised in a number of contexts. The question is this, is the panel reviewing the accountability mechanisms in peacekeeping operations? Are you going to, for example, 
address questions such as arose in Haiti with the cholera epidemic. That that's only one illustration of the problems of accountability. How how, how are you um, trying to assess these challenges of how to ensure that the peacekeepers and those associated with peacekeeping operations are in fact held to some standards of accountability? <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, the issue of uh, accountability is, is something that we absolutely must um, address. I think, um, first of all, with respect to the, uh, I think, um, issues, uh, say, of um, conduct, discipline, um, you know, uh, behavior of, of troops with respect to sexual exploitation, abuse, uh, you know, just other things that, that might happen in, in, in terms of in, in, in that contact. Uh, I think over the years, um, you know, the trend, we have been uh, emphasizing more uh, the training and, uh, you know, building this in into pre-deployment training. So that includes modules on human rights, on understanding gender dimensions, understanding issues related to, you know, as I said, um, sexual exploitation and violence. The overall trend, overall trend is yeah. that, you know, these, um, these um, overall is, is, is decreasing in the missions. But, you know, I think the, and, and of course, the UN has a zero tolerance policy with respect to this. But, you know, even if trends are decreasing, I think it just takes one, sure. you know, sort of, Misbehavior somewhere, which is you know it's it's very difficult to to yeah. kind of unravel from 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 that. So I certainly think that the UN has to do much more in terms of the accountability. I think some of that relates to our own internal systems of justice mm -hmm. and the ability to deal with that. The second is with respect to troop contributing countries mm -hmm. and police yes. contributing countries, right. where you know there is a separate mechanism which is now in, in place through the General Assembly and the rules and regulations by which um, you know those troops are not staff members, the police members are not, they're experts on mission, so they're guided by different set of uh, uh, rules and regulations. But what we do in the case so far is that we immediately inform the host government and the troops are then subject to their country's um, you know, disciplinary measures, judicial uh, system, and they inform the UN in terms of what has been um, you know, done in regard to the resolution of, of these cases. Again, I think that some of it may not be so satisfactory, so I think we will address this issue and, and look at how, how, how we can strengthen the accountability in the system of justice. Mm -hmm. I think we have time maybe just for one last question and it sort of goes to the heart of what you said at the outset, which is that um, the burdens of peace operations um, are not being at the moment equitably shared. We've got preponderance of troop contributors from the developing world, frankly, Asia, Africa. Um, and there was a hope that uh, at the end of the Afghanistan mission that perhaps some of those international troops might be um, uh, redeployed in a way or recommitted to UN peace operations. How are you planning to address this whole issue of how do we broaden the base of contributions to peace operations in all their dimensions? And what's the mechanism by which we, we, we get there? And, and perhaps related to that, is there a new possibility or prospect for doing what we had always wanted to do, which is to have a, a rapid reaction kind of force to be ready to respond to emergency situations? Is there something else as, as well that you're going to be looking into? I can maybe just share with you uh, some concerns uh, raised in our consultations in Dhaka, Addis, and um, literally with any troop contributing country from the developing countries, mm -hmm. and that is the troop contributing countries from South Asia, Africa, provide the troops, uh, the Europeans, US pay, and they bargain. You know, you would know that uh, one UN peacekeeper, 
cost of average $2,000 uh, a month. A NATO uh, soldier in deployment costs about $20,000 uh, a month. Uh, uh, so you can see the, uh, and the, the delivery, uh, you know, the execution of the uh, mandate uh, through my personal observation, experience, vary uh, from mission to mission, depends on uh, the troops or the police force uh, that are recruited. Uh, sometimes the UN has vetting system, but uh, there is also uh, pressure for time to deliver. You know, you cannot go on and on uh, interviewing people. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes SRGG is on the ground very exasperating and desperate about uh, lack of decisions from New York. So sometimes uh, when you have to mobilize uh, thousands of police or troops, uh, you not al always you can afford to be too choosy. That's what, so we have problems of performance. Mm -hmm. The problem of performance has to do with also mobility, with equipment, logistics, etc. There have been criticisms of the Europeans, Americans for not contributing to peacekeeping, and uh, I, I, people say because they don't want to die. Well, I don't personally, I don't agree with that because Americans, Europeans, died by the thousands in Afghanistan, and they didn't pack and leave. You know, the issue has more to do with the sensitivities on the part of U.S. or Europeans, in a sense, because. When you deploy uh, French troops or British troops, or whatever, uh, to any theater of operation in Africa, something goes wrong, immediately they say, well, neocolonization from the European, through back door, through peacekeeping. So the Europeans are genuinely reluctant to be drawn into these controversies. But there is ongoing discussion. You, if you saw the speech by the high representative of the European Union to the Security Council yesterday. Mm -hmm. We met with her in New York, in, Geneva, in Brussels. So there is a renewed review. Actually, they are doing a strategic review, the European Union, to see how much more now they can contribute to UN partnership, whether with troop deployment, which they are already doing. The Dutch are in good numbers in Mali. Uh, but particularly with equipment, with logistics, with training, which the U.S. Uh, is doing. The Japanese government and the current Prime Minister Abe are in the process of reviewing uh, legislation, I think 16 pieces of legislation, in order to enable Japanese uh, troops to be deployed to peace, in peacekeeping. Cool. But uh, in personal conversations with the Japanese, I said, you know, knowing a bit Japanese politics, I said, why don't you focus on logistics, on training, on uh, that, you know, less controversial in Japan? Because you cannot have an effective fighting force or police force without very good infrastructures, uh, logistics, mobility uh, for them. And that has been one of the handicaps of the UN. Uh, so. so that's uh, what uh, it's obvious to uh, ev everybody uh, as we review. Another uh, criticism has been, and that we are looking at, is the lack of consultations between the troop contributing countries, Security Council, and UN Secretariat. Uh, <laughs> there have been some uh, informal consultation, but not something that is, uh, I say, uh, uh, acceptable to the troop contributing, particularly when a mission is ongoing. And because of development on the ground, the, sec the Secretary of the Security Council decide to change the mission mandate. That's when uh, troop contributing countries. There are other issues of uh, chain of command, authority. Because the temptation, if you are force commander from country A, somewhere in Africa or Asia, mm -hmm. and uh, you are the force commander, you lead a battalion, and you have other uh, and the UN, the special representative, tell you something. And uh, you are supposed to follow the special representative. He or she is the highest authority there. And only he or she may contact Secretary General. If he, but the force commander might decide, well, I'm going to call my defense minister back in my country and to see what he says. Or the prime minister or the foreign minister. <laughs> and this happened. And if you are force commander from a particular mm -hmm. country, if you don't consult with your uh, boss back in the capital and something goes wrong, you're going back the six months later. 
and you might be in doubt. So these are political and human uh, uh, realities that uh, the UN has to deal with, and it's not so black and white. And uh, so that requires what? Real, charismatic, strong leadership from the special representatives of the Secretary General on the ground, from the force commander, and people who, like any of us, in any uh, our situation, our lives, you know, we influence behavior through our uh, personality, through our uh, vision. Uh, and uh, that's what happened also when you are SRCG. You are fully committed. If you are dedicated, you uh, create uh, respect among the, the people around you, not only your own, but the country you are serving, yeah, you can produce miracles, you know, with no troops. You can do it through sheer personality, through sheer determination, commitment. And I've seen some uh, SISGs uh, from the UN uh, being able to do that. Uh, I witnessed that. Some are here uh, with me in this room, you know, Ian Martin. He's uh, remembered in Timor from his courage in 99 in dealing with incredible complex situation there. Amir Haq was special representative secretary general in Timor-Leste and uh, uh, Hilda Johnson did you know, the most uh, courageous, uh, risky thing in uh, South Sudan. She ordered the gates of the UN open for tens of thousands of uh, people fleeing. <laughs> and uh, what you're supposed to do, and they are still there. <laughs> and uh, so these are decisions that have been to be taken by the people on the ground who need strong backing from headquarters, from strong backing from the Secretary General, from the powers that be, and not abandoning them when things uh, go wrong. Well, um, this has been, a, I think, a perfect launch to the conversations that we will be continuing now throughout the morning. And Hopefully, we will be able to return to some of these themes and subjects in the, in the breakout panels that we'll be having later on today. But I want to pause here and thank uh, the chair and the vice chair of the panel for getting us off uh, on a good start. And, um, and would I invite you all to join me in, in, in thanking them. Thank you. And uh, now I have the further privilege and honor to introduce um, a good friend and uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Rashiba Crocker was uh, confirmed as Assistant Secretary of State for International Organization Affairs in September 2014. We won't mention how long she waited before that confirmation came through, but we're delighted to see her in that position. Uh, prior to that, she held several senior positions at the State Department, including as uh, senior advisor to Secretary of State, as the principal deputy director of the, in the Office of uh, Policy Planning, <clears throat> and as uh, chief of staff to the deputy Secretary of State. Um, in 2007-2008, Ms. Crocker was the senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary General for Peacebuilding Support at the United Nations. And she's also served as Deputy Chief of Staff to the UN Special Envoy for Tsunami Recovery. It's a pleasure and honor for me to, uh, to welcome her to the podium. Thank you, Ambassador Moose. Uh, welcome to Chairman Ramos Horta and Vice Chair Hawk and your fellow panel members. And thank you to USIP, uh, a place near and dear to my heart, and the United Nations Foundation for making today's conversation possible. I am honored to participate in this excellent event. Last September in New York, I participated in the Peacekeeping Summit co-hosted by Vice President Biden, the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, Rwanda, Japan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, and the enthusiasm in the room and the commitment of the summit participants to contribute to UN peacekeeping missions and to help fill key gaps was palpable. 
Our hope is that today's event will build off that enthusiasm and that it will be one additional step on the path to strengthening and reforming UN peace operations and UN peacekeeping. Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken will speak today about why the United States would like to see UN peace operations reformed and what specifically we would like to see the high-level panel focus on. I think it's fair to note that we are at a unique moment as the world faces a dramatic level of security challenges, from political crises in Libya and Yemen, to the situations in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, to the CAR and South Sudan, just to name a few. And with both major and minor crises today, the United Nations is there being asked to play a role from preventing a relapse to war, to addressing extremist threats to governance, to helping stave off Ebola, to trying to end the abuse of children as soldiers, just to name, just, and so much more. I'm struck by how much, then, we need to look at modernizing the United Nations to keep up with this demand. Certainly, its power lies in its uniqueness, and as it brings the weight of the world's nations to bear against such problems, and with it a clear voice and legitimacy. It's been, as we've heard, 15 years since the Brahimi Report, which last addressed comprehensively the reform of UN field missions. Yet, as our ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power, noted in her remarks in Brussels yesterday, we are asking peacekeepers to do more in more places and in more complex conflicts than at any time in history. So we have a lot to discuss today. And on that note, I'm pleased to introduce US Deputy Secretary of State, Tony Blinken. Deputy Secretary Blinken is no stranger to peacekeeping. Before joining the State Department in January, Tony held senior foreign policy positions in two administrations spanning two decades, most recently as uh, President Obama's principal deputy national security advisor. And in that capacity, Tony played a key role in helping to make the Vice President's Peacekeeping Summit last September a success. Prior to working at the White House for President Obama and Vice President Biden, uh, Tony spent six years on the Hill as Democratic Staff Director for the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He also worked on President Clinton's national security staff, including as Chief Foreign Policy Speechwriter and as his principal advisor on Europe, the European Union, and NATO. Throughout, Tony has seen or worked on every permutation of UN peace operations, as well as multinational force operations of every stripe, from Kosovo to Bosnia to Somalia to South Sudan, Mali, Iraq, and Afghanistan more recently. <coughs> Tony is deeply versed in the needs, the challenges, and the opportunities. He has seen where our collective efforts have worked and where they have fallen short. And perhaps most pertinent to today's discussions, he knows better than almost anyone what the United States can contribute to those efforts. I can think of no one better to situate today's conversations than Deputy Secretary Blinken. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Good morning. It's very, very good to be with all of you. And Shiva, thank you for uh, a wonderful introduction. We've been colleagues off and on for the past uh, couple of decades, although you couldn't tell by looking at Shiva. Um, and it's great to be with you. It's particularly good to be here at the Institute of Peace. Um, one of the uh, wonderful things about my uh, relatively new job is that I get to look out my window at this building. And when I need a little bit of uh, inspiration, and a little bit of calm in the day. I look out the window and I look here. Uh, not just because the building is so spectacular, but because of what, go what goes on in this building. Uh, the efforts to add to our storehouse of intellectual capital in thinking about issues uh, of war and peace uh, is so important. And so I'm grateful to the Institute and the United Nations Foundation for hosting this dialogue and for a long-standing commitment on this critical issue. Um, but let me begin, first of all, by thanking His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta and the distinguished panelists uh, for tireless work over the course uh, of this year. What you say, what you write, what you advise through this process will help set the course of peace for the next decade. It's hard to think of a more important charge. The United States stands firmly alongside you in this effort to modernize UN peace operations and strengthen this essential contribution to global security. This is no easy task. Nearly seven decades ago, the first two UN peacekeeping missions were composed of unarmed military observers with the consent of warring parties 
They monitored ceasefires across, uh, along contentious borders and built confidence on both sides of a conflict. Today, as we've already heard this morning, um, we ask our pe peacekeepers to face a world of far greater challenge, where sometimes there seems to be little peace to keep. It's a world where heavy weaponry and drugs slip quietly across borders, fomenting instability, financing criminality. A world where young boys can be conscripted as child soldiers and girls enslaved as child brides. A world where civilians are not the occasional victims, but often the frequent targets of unspeakable atrocities. From northern Nigeria to the Somali coast, state fragility and endemic violence repeatedly undermine hopes for a lasting peace. And we know that extremism finds fertile ground in this vacuum of authority, threatening our security and challenging our most basic values. In this world where conflict poses a danger to all of us, peacekeeping remains a responsibility from all of us. We cannot close our eyes or bury our heads in the sand, but we also cannot and should not have to face these global challenges and global responsibilities alone. When violence erupts or political transitions break down, UN peace operations are often the best tool we have to protect civilians, to stop the violence, to facilitate peace, and rebuild states and societies. Today, unfortunately, uh, those involved in peace operations are in a growth industry. The demand for their services is at an all-time high. Nearly 130,000 brave men and women carry out 16 missions worldwide, by far the most peacekeepers that have ever been active in history. Two-thirds of them serve in conflict areas, where they operate under robust and demanding mandates, often at great risk to themselves. Just this past weekend, as you all know, an attack in Mali killed a peacekeeper and injured other people, a tragedy that only serves to deepen our common commitment to peace. We turn to peacekeepers to protect civilians from atrocities in the Central African Republic, to disarm rebels and prevent sexual violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo, to help reestablish state authority and stability in Mali. We also turn to UN political missions to work for diplomatic solutions in Libya and Yemen, to press for security and governance in Iraq and Afghanistan, and to support efforts for peaceful transitions in Somalia and in Burundi. In virtually all of these circumstances, we are asking the UN to carry out their duties in countries where governments are extremely weak and often unable to meet the basic needs of their people. So while challenges to peacekeeping have fundamentally changed, the truth is that we as a peacekeeping community largely have not. And this goes, I think, to the heart of the challenge that we face. Too often, missions are deployed with long and overly complicated mandates, inadequate planning, weak leadership. Too often, staffing shortages, competing chains of command, uneven commitments undercut success from the very beginning. In the worst of cases, these failings conspire to create an environment where abuses go unchecked and civilians unprotected. We know we have to do better to equip UN peacekeepers with the flexibility, with the capacity, and the political backing to meet 21st century challenges. The United States is deeply invested in this effort. Since the very start of his administration, President Obama has emphasized and recognized our nation's commitment to multilateral security initiatives. In 2009, he chaired an unprecedented roundtable meeting with top troop and police contributing nations at the UN General Assembly pledging our support for new proposals that strengthen peace operations. And as uh, Sheba referenced just a few moments ago, just last year, but, excuse me, Vice President Biden co-hosted the UN Summit on Peacekeeping Operations, and just yesterday, as was referenced, Ambassador Powers in Brussels to urge greater commitment from European nations. In the face of volatile, asymmetric threats from Mali to the DRC, we know it won't be enough to make small changes, small tweaks, around the edges of the existing system. We have to embrace big, bold thinking that fundamentally redefines peacekeeping for a new era. That is why Secretary General Ban Ki-moon wisely convened this important panel and sought the expertise of each of you. As you formulate your recommendations, I would urge you to take this opportunity to think not only strategically, but also progressively about the future of peace operations. And to this end, with your permission, I'd just like to outline a few areas where our administration would encourage the panel to take a close look. First and foremost, 
we believe we have to significantly strengthen the capacity of peace operations we deploy. This means expanding the base of contributors, facilitating rapid deployment, improving command and control, and working aggressively to prevent abuses and corruption. It means investing in strategic planning in a way that anticipates modern threats, like organized crime, IEDs, suicide bombers. And it means prioritizing leadership and management skills, rigorously assessing the performance of senior mission leaders and taking action to remove ineffective leaders. The international community took a meaningful step forward in bolstering peacekeeping capacity in September at the UN summit. Nearly one-third of the more than 30 countries in attendance announced they were considering new contributions of infantry battalions or force enablers to UN missions. Some nations reaffirmed their long-standing commitments, including Bangladesh and the Netherlands, and others offered to participate for the first time, like Colombia. Mexico announced it would deploy troops to UN peacekeeping for the first time in 60 years. Indonesia announced it would increase its troops from 1,800 to 4,000 and create a standby rapid response force. Sweden announced it would deploy 250 troops to conduct intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance in Mali. Latvia has already followed through on its commitment to provide 50,000 euros to two peacekeeping initiatives in the Middle East and in Africa. And China announced it will continue to expand its participation already at more than 2,000 troops. For our part in the United States, we'll continue to do our part. As the largest financial contributor to UN peacekeeping, we cover more than 28% of annual costs and provide extensive airlift, logistical support, and medical services for both UN and African Union peacekeepers. Today, we maintain 1,400 troops in peacekeeping operations in Kosovo and the Sinai, and we're continuously working to identify gaps that the United States is uniquely positioned to fill. But more must be done to ensure that peacekeepers can actually deliver against increasingly robust mandates. In South Sudan, peacekeeping operations were still more than 2,000 troops short a year after the Security Council authorized an emergency increase in troops. In Mali, the mission has had to spend millions of dollars just to transport water to its troops and has yet to reach full capacity. Equipping peacekeepers with the latest and advanced technology can help make up for the shortfalls they endure. In the DRC, peacekeepers are using unarmed, unmanned aerial vehicles to help them patrol vast distances and dense forests. When a UAV detected a ferry accident on Lake Kivu last year, peacekeepers immediately deployed their speedboats and helicopters to the scene and were able to save 15 lives. In Mali, UAVs are giving peacekeepers an advantage in the fight against armed insurgents over immense deserts. By applying these high-tech advances, we help alleviate the pressure of expanded keep peacekeeping mandates, strengthen operations in treacherous territory, and most importantly, save the lives of peacekeepers and civilians alike. At the end of the day, however, the kinds of conflicts we're talking about, the kinds of challenges we're asking our peacekeepers to confront, will not be resolved simply with more helicopters or more troops. They have political causes, they require political solutions. Special political missions are uniquely designed in this regard, so it's especially fitting that they're part of this panel's review. With expertise in everything from crisis management to peace building, these missions can bring diverse voices and recalcitrant parties together in meaningful dialogue. As the Secretary General has rightly noted, UN operations do not need to be binary, a binary choice between peacekeeping and political missions. They can work alongside each other to mitigate violence, facilitate political settlements, and we urge the panel to strengthen these tools at the same time. Ultimately, we know that no country wants to rely on others for its own security, to outsource the protection of its own citizens. And that's why this past summer, the United States answered the call from African countries for help building their own capacity to respond to crises in their own neighborhoods. At the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit, President Obama announced the African Peacekeeping Rapid Response Partnership to help an initial group of six countries rapidly deploy and sustain peacekeeping operations. Because we know the earlier that we can act, the more lives we can save. Regardless of mission, regardless of nationality, there is one constant that must remain true in peacekeeping, one principle 
on which we cannot compromise, and that is the protection of civilians. From the refugee camps of eastern Congo to the remote villages of South Sudan, civilians look to the blue flag of the United Nations with hope in the midst of desperate, deadly circumstances. There can be sometimes no greater symbol of hope, of possibility, of life than that blue flag. But far too often, they find themselves on their own. That's what happened on the evening of June 6, 2014, when armed rebels attacked an outdoor church service in the Congolese town of Nusrule. Just five miles away, peacekeepers were stationed with a mandate to use force as necessary to protect them. But the blue helmets never showed. More than 30 people were massacred that night, including eight children, among them a four-year-old child. The United States must fulfill its responsibility to protect civilians with firm and urgent resolve. We cannot solve the challenges that face peace operations by narrowing mandates, and indeed doing so would undermine the very path to peace. Just last month, on the 10th of February, MINUSCA and French forces engaged rebels in the Central African Republic without a single death or injury among the forces or the civilians. Not long after the operation, the rebel leader ordered his troops out of government buildings and opened the door to peace by allowing grassroots consultations to proceed. That's precisely the difference peacekeepers can and must make. So over the next six months, we will have a number of opportunities to continue this discussion, a discussion that will go forward today, in the days and weeks ahead, uh, leading to uh, the fall. Yesterday in Brussels, Ambassador Power announced that President Obama will convene a summit of world leaders in September to ask the international community to focus further on UN missions and press for greater reforms. I've heard the President speak to this in the confines of the White House with extraordinary passion and extraordinary focus. This is something that deeply matters to him. This mission is critical, and the opportunity before us in the months ahead is absolutely vital. Now, the Netherlands already hosted a meeting of European countries in support of this effort. Uruguay, Indonesia, Ethiopia will each host a regional conference in the coming months. At the end of March, the United Nations will host chiefs of defense from almost 100 countries for the first time ever. Taken together, these efforts can make a powerful difference, provided we continue to work in partnership. Because at the end of the day, this is a task that we have to face together with bold ideas and in anticipation of the challenges that await us tomorrow. We owe nothing less to civilians who look to the United Nations as a last resort when their lives are on the line. We owe it to the peacekeepers and the political missions that serve far from home under desolate and dangerous conditions to fulfill the most noble of causes. Whether they're escorting convoys of humanitarian supplies, building confidence at the negotiating table, their service, their sacrifice embody our shared commitment to the rights, to the freedoms, to the dignity of all people. The United States greatly looks forward to the findings of this panel. We're grateful to you for the work you're doing, for the spirit you're bringing to this enterprise, and we're grateful um, to everything uh, that you have in front of you. And mostly, uh, you have our commitment to work in meaningful partnership to strengthen peace operations around the world and to strengthen the work of the United Nations. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Peter Yeo. I'm a Vice President of the United Nations Foundation and President of the Better World Campaign. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Secretary. Uh, it was a pleasure working with you on the Hill um, when you were on the Senate side and I was on the House side. And uh, pleasure to work you, with you in your new um, uh, role at the State Department. Uh, thank you for your incredibly thoughtful comments about the future of peacekeeping. And in particular, reminding us that peace operations ensure that the U.S. doesn't have to go out alone. Uh, that, in fact, peace operations allow the United States um, to work with partners around the world to ensure better outcomes in terms of emerging from conflict. 
and also uh, for your charge to the panel to think about big, bold thinking on the future of peace operations, particularly focused in terms of capacity as well as the protection of civilians, and also for reminding us that the President himself is personally aware and engaged on the issue of peace operations, understands their value, and understands their importance. Um, thank you, uh, President Ramos Horta, uh, Under Secretary General Amira Haq, the other panel members, for your very in-depth perspective about peace operations moving forward. Um, and most importantly, giving us a clear vision about how the panel is going to be conducting its work. Um, it has been conducting and will be conducting its work through broad-ranging regional consultations uh, that ensure that the broadest number of people have an opportunity to offer their views about peace, peace operations so that you can come up with the most effective report and recommendations possible. Um, also reminding us about the greater number of responsibilities and mandates that peace operations are facing uh, in this uh, incredibly complex world. Um, and particularly, Amir Haq, uh, thank you for your reminder uh, that as we think about these larger number of mandates and the complex um, ro uh, responsibilities being given to peace operations, that we need to make sure that they successfully meet the expectations of civilians who are being affected by these peace operations. With more mandates, there's greater expectations. And if we're going to ensure that these peace operations are successful, then we need to make sure that there's a right uh, mix of resources, political uh, influence, uh, to ensure that we get to yes. And um, uh, President Ramos Horta, uh, at the beginning of your consultations, you talked about the girl from South Sudan and her grandfather. And I think that's an important reminder to us all as we think about the importance of peace operations, um, that it, they have concrete impacts and uh, uh, affect people in real life situations. And your decision to name the report uh, after this girl, I think, is, um, is, is wonderful. Um, I think that uh, as we think about what it means in the future for there to be successful peace operations, we obviously need to think about troop contributing countries. Uh, they are the ones that provide the more than 130,000 um, troops and police officers and other civilians who are essential uh, to the success of this. Um, as the, now the largest deployed military force in the world, uh, troop contributing countries are essential to the solution. Donor countries, not only in terms of the United States paying more than 28% of the bills uh, for peace operations, but also, um, uh, as Hilda Johnson uh, reminded us, uh, ensuring that the uh, broader humanitarian, political, economic development situation in these countries is being dealt with to ensure that once the peace operations um, wind up, uh, that in fact there is a, uh, an environment uh, conducive to um, uh, growth, uh, reconciliation, and a successful independent country moving forward. Um, I think partner governments themselves, I mean, ultimately, the government of Timor-Leste is successful because of your leadership, Pre President Ramos Horta, and the other political leaders who work with the peacekeepers, work with peace operations, and ultimately, uh, Timor-Leste is in a stronger position because of the partnership that happened on the ground between your government uh, and the peace operations. Um, and then finally, it's a comprehensive partnership, as I mentioned, with the people that are most affected by peace operations. So there have been um, so many thoughtful questions that were submitted today uh, for the, uh, the panel, uh, some of which were asked, but we wanted to pr provide you with the reassurance that if you wrote a question, the panel members will have an opportunity to see your question um, and it will be factored into the considerations today. Um, I also want to thank uh, USIP uh, for hosting us in this incredibly beautiful building, um, as well in particular Bill Taylor, George Moose, and George Lopez, as well as the State Department that works so closely uh, with everybody here today to make this a success, in particular Sheba Crocker and Tori Holt. Um, and, uh, uh, and I want to also remind you um, that there is a reception this evening at the United Nations Foundation um, at 5.30 so we, uh, with the high-level panel members. So we urge you to join us this evening at 5.30 if you haven't RSVP'd already. I uh, look forward to having you this evening. So um, uh, our panel members and our, the Deputy Secretary will be exiting that way, but uh, uh, I wanted to uh, ask you to join me in thanking all of them for their leadership and for their inspirational words today. Thank you all for coming.